to the court right now. Okay, brilliant. Because yeah, Diana's super like, she said, write in your planner, because I'm, you know, me and my paper planner. She's like, tell Neil to record. I want to see this. And I was like, okay. Yeah. Yeah, man, I was, I was doing the PowerPoint, man, for this. And I, I, I did way too much, man. It was like way. Uh-oh. That so actually I'm, sounds fun. But I'm going to have to like, I'm going to have to speed through it because it's honestly, it's, it's 90 slides. <laughs> oh my god so <laughs> i know i know i know i know but it's 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 90 slides but i could i'll find a way i'll find a way to make it work okay because <laughs> <laughs> i want to there's so much i wanted to say and so much i wanted to include uh-huh well neil if you have to do a part two you just have to do a part two. Oh, yeah, true. i like that <laughs> true 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 but no, I'll, I'll, I'll find a way to, to make, because if I, I can't really, if I do a part two, it wouldn't really, I'll leave people on the edge and, and what, how I start wouldn't really make any sense, you know? To be waiting in suspense for a couple of weeks. <laughs> nah, but, oh yeah. my goodness. Did you go to the Regina Bradley talk? Mm-mm. Wednesday? You didn't go to the Outcast talk? No, no, I don't. I don't. I didn't even hear of it. Neil, this is oh, what happens when you don't read goodness. your email. I wish you hadn't said that. That means you're not reading my email. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> don't worry, Barbara. He doesn't read anyone's emails. Yes, I, I do, <laughs> man. I do. I just, I have a hard time reading emails to to general populations. I just responded to your email, Barbara, because it was directed to exa- exactly towards me. <laughs> <laughs> you, okay, I, so from now I'm gonna send the weekly to you only. <laughs> you get your but own. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely read those because I, I don't know. I have like a little filter in my own mind. It's like when I it see can't matter because like <laughs> it's like the the general stuff is a hit or miss. It's like yeah. most of the time it doesn't really apply to me, and I just kind of just skim over it or just put it off till later. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I know, I know, I know it. I know it really applies to me, but I'm just. I got so many emails that are specifically to me that I just I try to answer those as fast as I could. No excuses, though. I get it. My bad. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> yeah, goofy. It's so weird. It, normally, my Fridays are like my grading and my PJs days, and instead, this week we have like all these. Or this semester, I feel like we have all these talks between the NEH grant and the faculty center stuff, and the and I'm just like, what is this talk for specifically? Is is this for the NEH grant or what is this? No, this is uh, Marissa Bell wanted us to do a series of like um, grants that talked about all the things we were doing because a lot of people were doing um, sort of equity theme talks, and she was like, but we've been teaching diversity stuff so long, we should be doing stuff at faculty center. Yeah. And, um, okay. And she wrangled us all. It's the way I remember it. I, Barbara probably knows the official why we're here. I'm not sure what the official reason is. No, that's pretty much the way I recall it too. Okay. <laughs> I, all I know is one day I got a text message saying, hey, you want to present something? And I was like, sure. And yeah. then I, she's like, what do you want to present on? And I just, I just came up with something. And then I changed my hey, mind. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but are we starting at nine thirty or nine? I think it's nine. Okay. I was the clock awkward. on my laptop is super fun. It's nine, and I'm going to send an email remind. Everyone should have gotten a reminder yesterday, but I'm going to send one more um, just to be sure everyone has the link. I thought I just was supposed to click on the Zoom link, and I didn't realize I had to register with Sign Me Up, so I only registered this morning. Oops. <laughs> The, uh, events. Oh, sound like someone's beatboxing over there, kind of. Building a house. <laughs> you might want to. We have that solar too. Okay. Definitely sounds like they're building a house. <laughs> You're right. <laughs>
Hey, Neil, do you want me Hello. to help you? Do you want me to help you with um, letting people in and stuff? Yes, please. Thank you. Do you, do you want to make me co-host? Yeah, let me do that real quick. Right. I'm I'm in my pajamas, so I'm gonna keep my camera turned off. <laughs> for part yeah, how of do this. I how do I make a, a co-host? Go to the participants list and find Marissa Bell. Okay. And then on the right hand side, there should be if you hover over, it should okay. say more, or you see three dots. Yeah. Oops, not her. Wrong person. And it's already being recorded okay. so that we can get it to Diana. Katie, I was just about to remind you of that. <laughs> Thanks. So make co-host. Okay. So then while you're presenting, I'll let people in. Do you, right? Because you have a Yeah. That way, because it's 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 really disruptive when you're trying to present and people are trying to, and you're trying to let people into the Zoom room too. <laughs> I'm glad Neil zooms like I do, where like every now and then he just leans in awkwardly. Yeah. I do this all the time and people make fun of me and I'm glad to see someone else do it. I'm like, what is this contraption right here? This I'm like, can you see up my nose yet? <laughs> That's why, Katie, you have to set like mine set up high. So like I can't do that because it's set up a little bit away from me. So if I do lean in, it doesn't look like you're up my nose. It's just a little bit. It's just like, oh, I'm just leaning in to talk. <laughs> But the worst is when I can't hear someone. Occasionally I give someone the whole ear and then I'm like, right now, there's a camera. <laughs> it's, always the say, it's always the students. I just have to say, this is the perfect way to start this morning. <laughs> right? <laughs> Listening to this is just phenomenal for me. So I just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> that's, that's our department. That's just... <laughs> No, but Katie, I feel like it's always one student who decides that like they can't, they, they have to be like on their phone in their car and they're, and you're like, but I can't yeah. hear you. I can't, yeah. like, I really want to hear you. Like what you don't understand, I really want to hear you. The like, best is when they're on their phone in their car and you hear the drive through people. <laughs> okay. I haven't had that yet. I I've had that. That's a good one. There's a star. Sometimes it's Starbucks and sometimes it's like Chick-fil-A and they're like, here's your order. And you're like, food. <laughs> I mean, I respect that they like they care about the class so much that they don't want to miss it. You know what I mean? Like that's where when they're like, I'm gonna be in my car, I'm like, that's fine. I just yeah. I, I get it. You don't want to miss my, my class. Cool. Right. But that's how I see it. So uh. Lord, we better start right on time. Neil was telling me he made 90 slides. No. <laughs> 90 slides. No, I'm but... you out. You're gonna throw me out of your Zoom room. Hey, it's pictures, right? That's okay. Yeah, like I'm just gonna zoom through like literally zoom through yeah. and uh <laughs> i didn't realize like i was i was making it i was like all this stuff i wanted to include and i kept putting stuff in and i was like and i looked at it and i was like damn i'm at like 65 slides <laughs> and i was like i'm like i'm not even half done yet so <laughs> i had to find a way to kind of like break it down and i don't know condense it a little bit yeah, nothing wrong nothing wrong with more slides you, it, there's no there's nothing that says you have to do like a minute per slide yeah, yeah, right? yeah. you just go through them we do pictures yeah. that's what we do yeah. yeah so a lot of it is is like pictures not a lot but some of them is pictures yeah cool so i apologize y'all are going to get a, a an email reminder so yeah that's fine I, close to 40 people registered. We have 40 people registered for this. So I just want to make sure everyone has the link to get on and, and they don't have to go searching for it. That's awesome, though. That's great. Neil, right, you're so, popular. Yeah. <laughs> so it's 9 o'clock now, so I'm going to um, I'm gonna start talking about this, <clears throat> this thing here. So let me share my screen. Can y'all see that? Yep. Yep. Yes. Yes. Can y'all still see it? Yes. All right. So, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'll, morning. Be, your, I'll be your professor, morning. Neil Goss. And uh, today we're doing, uh, I wanted, I was asked by Marissa Bell a few months ago that, uh, to do this presentation. And I, at first I didn't really know what I wanted to do. 
um, at first I, I was like, well, let's talk about race in America or something. And then I was like, nah, I don't really, I don't really want to just do something like that. That's first of all, I don't even know if I know enough about it. And secondly, something that I've been more passionate about has been like Africans in their own uh, emancipation uh, from slavery. And one of the reasons why I've been passionate about it is because I think ever since I was a little kid, I've always, I've always, you know, took a little bit of issue with the paternalistic perspective that's presented to us that, you know, this great white heroes decided one day to just say, you know, slavery is, is wrong. And then they just liberated people like that. And without really giving any type of agency to the Africans themselves in this process. So I started, and then when I took Trent Domingo's class, he was actually the first person um, that really ever told me a different perspective on the emancipation of the slaves uh, when he had us reading an article about Abraham Lincoln. And so ever since then, that was in 2004 when I took Trent Domingo's class. So I was like, ever since then, I've always been like searching for this, this knowledge on uh, African-Americans throughout history not only African-Americans, but Africans throughout the diaspora. And so this presentation that I have here is not only going to touch on Black people in the United States, but it's going to touch on uh, Black people throughout the African diaspora. Because I think in order to understand, to truly understand the, the African-American experience, you can't stay within the confines of the national boundaries that's been imposed upon the people. You're right. There's, you're going you're gonna to have to cross borders. And that's in studying the African diaspora, you'll realize that a lot of people of African descent found connections and found alliances with people <laughs> who, were, who were just like them on the outside of the confines of this country. Oh, no. Like three minutes on the uh, first slide. So, <laughs> so the question is always is has been like who freed the slaves, right? And the, the immediate thing that most people think of once we say that is Abraham Lincoln, right? And if you're from the if you're from the British West Indies, you'll probably say something like William Wilberforce, right? You'll you'll probably most likely name some of these uh, great white men who were who were heroes. And this is not to take any credit away from anything that they had done, but it's just to kind of, this presentation is more to show the, the things that the Africans themselves had done in the process of finding their own freedom. So typically, the answer to this question is these, these two individuals, Abraham Lincoln, William Wilberforce, and if you're in uh, some other part of the world, it, 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 it would probably be somebody else, whether the French Empire or the Dutch Empire or whatever. But these are the two, uh, Main people I'm kind of concerned with right here. So, but in order to, to really understand the perspective I'm coming from, you have to have a real paradigm shift in the way you're understanding the world, in the way you're understanding history. Okay. We typically see what like Lincoln as the great emancipator, right? The Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, he pushed for the 13th Amendment, which is the legal abolition of slavery during the Civil War. We typically think of the Civil War as being the war in which it was fought to end slavery, right? We think Lincoln went into the war to end slavery, and that's usually how we kind of just understand history. And it's just left at that. Not really realizing some of the nuances that are involved with the whole thing. We have a tendency to look at history through uh, legal dates, right, that are documented. Uh, here are just a series of dates for certain territories or societies that abolished slavery. We see Vermont uh, as early as 1777, and then you go all the way down, you see Haiti, Mexico, and all these places throughout time, all the way ending with Brazil in 1888, right? So these are, these are legal dates that we typically say slavery ended at this time, and before this, slavery existed. After this date, slavery ended. The state granted these African Americans their freedom. And after that point, they were free. And it's, and it's as simple as that. 
But I, I don't look at history that simple. Right? I don't just see it like that. The modern state, as we know it, is a Western European creation born out of the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. Right? Now, that's, this is an institution that we really don't question, the modern state. We pledge allegiance to our flags, we pay our taxes, and we kind of just accept the rule that the state has over us. But I'm called, but in, in, in discussing how African Americans have fought for the freedom through history, I'm also calling into question the legitimacy of the state. And I'm also calling into question the legitimacy of the definitions of freedom that the state has. Okay. So there's got to be a shift in our thinking to understand the perspective that I'm coming from. And to also understand how Africans had fought for their own freedom throughout history. In order to capture the essence of the true abolitionist movements, one has to examine those movements that have not always been legitimized by the state. Right? If this, just because the state says you're free, does that mean you're free? Or just because the state says that you're a piece of property, does that mean that you're truly a piece of property? If, if my enemy kidnaps me and puts me in their basement and I break free, does that mean I'm still a slave or I'm still being used by the person that kidnapped me and put me in their basement? No, if you break free, you break free. And one of the things I'm trying to show here is that Africans had fought for their freedom and had achieved that freedom successfully in periods prior to these abolition dates. And also at the same time, after these abolition dates, the same system has tried to find other ways to enslave these same people. So it's not something as simple as from slavery to freedom, which is the name of this, this John Hope Franklin book that you know I used to read in college. So there's gotta be an ontological shift, right? Philosophical shift our understanding of what it means to be. Paradigm shift. We got legitimate versus illegitimate. Valid versus invalid. The positivist approach versus anti-positivism. -positive, right? The positivism is, you know, the idea that, you know, you use things that are considered legit or valid or or being uh, asserted by authority as the only thing that's real, the only thing that makes sense, or the only thing that's legitimate. But this ontological shift that I'm, that I'm making here is I'm looking at, when I look at history, I don't just look at the things that are considered legitimate by authority, but I'm also looking at the things that, that were legitimate by the very people who made those things real for themselves. The modern state is the legitimate institution. Its existence is virtually unchallenged. Even historians, and the way, the way they discuss people of those days, uh, they refer to the African-Americans who were held captives. They call them slaves. It's a legal term, right? You call them slaves, but that's what they were. You call them slaves because that's what they were in those days, and that's the way we still think of them today. Anybody who's kidnapped today and is and is made a slave, we we at least give them their humanity. We call it human trafficking. In those days, we just call them slaves. I'm trying to dispel all these things because even in those days, the, these people really didn't see themselves as as being slaves, and they and they fought for their freedom. And they didn't see the, and many of them did not see the modern state as a legitimate institution. Why would they? Because seeing the modern state or seeing the state as a legitimate institution or seeing the colony as a legitimate institution would delegitimize them, would delegitimize themselves. So there has to be an ontological shift here. 
right? So we, when you think about it, that we the, the state is unquestioned, it's unchallenged. The state has a monopoly on violence, right? It has uh, a lot of sway on over, over the definitions that we that we think of. In our understanding, in our ontological understanding, right? War is not violence. Taxation is not theft. And the military draft is not slavery. Someone convinced us of these things along the way. Bear with me now. I'm just trying to get you guys to, to, to kind of think outside the box and how we think of things to be normative. Think about that. War is not violence. This is a map of the world and all the modern states that exist in this world, right? Unquestioned. We look at this and we think that this is how the world operates with sovereign political institutions that still exist to this day. You don't really see the world like this. But I see the world, when I look at the world during through history, this is a, a map of communities, what they used to call rebel or runaway slave communities or fugitive slave communities. These are legal terms, fugitive. You're breaking the law. All these little red spots that you that you see throughout the Americas, these are where Africans, people of African descent had escaped slavery, found their own freedom, and defended that freedom prior to anybody legitimizing that freedom. When I say anybody legitimizing the freedom, I'm talking about prior to the colonial state legitimizing that freedom. These things happened prior to the, the 19th century abolition that was going on throughout the Americas. So when I when I look at history, I look at it in a, from a perspective, de jure versus de facto. When I say when I say de jure, what do I what do I mean? Anybody want to chime in here? De jure means the law, from yes. my understanding, right? Yes. And de facto yes. means uh, like like if you look at like. It's the example that I would think of is like, like Jim Crow is de jure, whereas up north, if you know how people are separated by neighborhood, it's more like de facto. It's like you stay on your side and I stay on my side. Does that make any sense? Yes, that's perfect. De jure is the law. It's written in the law. It's telling you what to do, how to do it, and whatever. And de facto is a reality. It's a fact. It's just how it is, even though it's not written in the books. So we have sometimes we have a tendency to study history from a very de jure perspective. We look at legal dates and say all slavery existed, all black people were enslaved up until this date, and then after this date, they were all free. I think that's problematic because it doesn't really talk about any of the nuances, and, or it, it kind of like skips over all the freedom fights in all of the cases where people did find freedom. These red spots that you see on this map is people of African descent fighting for their freedom all throughout the Americas and creating communities, some of which still exist to this day, without the approval of their, their enemy, which was the colonial state. So this is de facto freedom. They call these communities maroon communities. They, they, they have its origin in the word cimarron. Cimarron originally was the word that the Spanish used to use to describe runaway cattle that used to escape up into the mountains. When, when the Spanish first came to the Americas and they brought their cattle and everything with them, the cattle used to escape plantations, go up into the mountains. And Sima, like means on top, 
Spanish, right? Cimarron was a word that was kind of like a word that was just used to describe that phenomenon. Once they started to bring enslaved Africans to the uh, to Latin America, these enslaved Africans would escape on top of the mountains as well and create their own freedom. They called them cimarrones, right? Um, the French eventually, when they started to bring slaves to the Americas, they adopted the word and called it mahon, and then the English adopted the word and called it maroon. So most most English refer to this as maroon communities. And the interesting thing about this is that. When the Spanish went to Spanish Florida and you had runaway slaves escaping in the Spanish Florida, as well as runaway Native Americans escaping in Spanish Florida, they used the word cimarron to describe them as well. But the word cimarron, plural is cimarrones. But in Spanish Florida, that word had become corrupted and cimarrones became known as cimanolas and cimanolas became known as seminoles. So the word seminal has its origin in the word cimarron, which is the word to describe runaway slaves. So even in Florida, you had the black Seminoles and you had the red Seminoles. People who were running away, a renegade group of people who were escaping the encro encroaching British along the eastern uh, coast of what would later become the United States. So we teach at Seminole State College, you can call this Runaway Slave State College. Just joking. So here's the, uh, I have this juxtaposed here. You got the illegitimate world of freedom. These red blotches here. And you have the legitimate world, right? The British owned this. The, the Spanish owned that. The French owned this. The Dutch owned that. But these people don't care two hoops about who owns what. Because as far as they're concerned, these people are their enemies, right? Anybody trying to take away their freedom? So I say this again. The state recognized emancipation. Eventually, the state started to recognize eman uh, emancipation for a number of reasons. But once they started to recognize emancipation, what happened? Well, if you look at the British West Indies, for instance, 1834. They recognize the abolition of slavery of the enslaved Africans in the British West Indies. But then they have four years of apprenticeship. So they don't want to completely free them. We'll, we'll keep them on the plantations. We'll force them to stay there. And if they work more than 45 hours, they can make a little bit of money. But the first 45 hours for the week that they work, they owe to us. And we'll provide them with provisions and make sure they have health care and food and things like that on the plantation. But we're not going to let them go free for another six years. This was this was the, the abolition plan for British for the British. And then when they started to get a lot of resistance and protests and rioting, then they finally let them go two years before that six year apprenticeship was up in the British West Indies. But you know who they started to ship in to the British West Indies to work on sugar plantations right after that? Indians. And so now you, they ship in one million, more than a million Indians between 1838 and 1920 throughout the British Empire. And not only that, the illegal slave ships that were coming, that were going to Cuba and Brazil that the British would confiscate, right? Because the British were the police of the world at the time. And they, 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 they claim that they wanted to abolish slavery and abolish the transatlantic slave trade. And so them as the police of the world would confiscate the ships traveling to Cuba and Brazil. But you know what they would do with those confiscated ships? They would send them to their own colonies and they would put them on their own plantations and working as indentured servants. So they got their labor one way or another. Sometimes the one who has the monopoly on violence and power is the one that's the biggest slave trader or drug dealer. The, uh, and then after this, what is interesting is what? 19th century, as slavery is getting abolished throughout the Western hemisphere, these same European colonial powers are going over to the East 
colonizing Africa, Asia in the 19th century. In 1884, 1885, there was the Berlin Conference which partitioned Africa as a piece of, like a piece of pie. The British, the French, the Belgians, the Italians, the Germans, the Spanish, the Portuguese, they partitioned Africa like a piece of pie to exploit it. And they treated populations within Africa as slave labor. The same countries that were claiming that they wanted to abolish slavery in the West Indies. So I take a little, I, I, uh, I get, I'm a little concerned with the definition of what, what freedom is or how the, how, how the state defines freedom or how we officially learn about freedom. Was the way that freedom truly through the state? I don't know. Something I, I often question. So by 1945, this is what the, the world looked like in terms of colonization, right? Most of Africa was colonized except for Ethiopia and Liberia. A lot of Southeast Asia was colonized. And even some of these places that weren't colonized, these, a lot of these countries have, been, have become, become uh, and victims of a sort of imperialism by the British and the French in the day. But even after 1940s and 50s, when we had World War II, right? When we had the Cold War and you had protests and all these abolition movements, or not abolition movements, but all these, uh, these freedom movements, decolonization movements, you had Another series of harassments on independence movement coming from US military and CIA interventions on countries that were just trying to be free. Right? The US intervened in about 80 elections since World War II. Many of third world countries Many of these countries were just getting their independence and freedom from these same colonial powers. In many of these same countries in which the United States has influenced through its CIA operations and toppling of government, you can find slave labor still existing throughout the world. This is a map of slavery in the world. Estimates say, as of 2014, 36 million people throughout the world enslaved. How many of these countries do we here in the West still profit from? How many transnational corporations make their profit off of slave labor? Sometimes I think we did. We never really attempted to truly abolish slavery. We just try to push it off of our borders so no one can see it. So the fight for freedom is not through the legitimizing by the state. The state will, will, will say anything to appease people or pacify people. But, this, but does the state truly support real freedom? No. Albert Einstein said freedom in any case, it's only possible by constantly struggling for it. I always say freedom is not something that 
you can achieve, it's something that you have to continuously fight to maintain. The moment you start saying, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free, and you start celebrating freedom, I would, I would start to question who's, who's telling you to celebrate that freedom. Because in many cases, the ones that are the most vocal about telling you how free you are might be the same ones that are slowly but surely trying to take that, that freedom away. So, all right, so I had to break this down here. I did all that to say that absolute freedom is not necessarily found through the framework of the state and is defining a freedom. Are y'all still with me or are y'all confused or because I'm, <laughs> let me go, hold on a second. I'm with you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I'm I think I'm making us think outside of the box, Neil. You're oh. making us think outside the box. Yes. Like Very that. well. Yes, I'm agree. I agree. All right, cool. You're Thank presenting you. something that we've been presented before in a different way, and I think that's pretty cool. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's it's eye opening. Yeah. All right, cool, cool. I'm just reading the comments you're, here. Yeah. You're doing great. Thank you. And I'd like to add real quick, uh, my family is from Haiti, and so hearing everything you're saying, Neil, is um, something I've been taught my whole life, but to hear it from a different additional perspectives mm -hmm. have been amazing, and even in terms of Haiti paying retributions to France for years after mm -hmm. they revolted, and how that... Um, even the system on the global scale is still repressive and mm -hmm. you are independent, but not so much. And then look at that country, third world, they're horrible, but a system was set in place, conspired globally, that that was when you will not be a prosperous black nation. That's just what it won't be. So I appreciate this conversation. And we're, and we're actually gonna talk a little bit about that too, as okay. we go through, yeah. Are you going to talk about Basa as well? I'm from the British West Indies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in there. All right, cool. Just making sure, sure y'all are with me. Y'all are way better than my students. <laughs> my students will be falling asleep at this point. I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm going to talk about three different ways that Africans fought for their freedom. I've split, I, I, I typically split it up into three different categories. There's the creation of the Maroon nations in spite of the existence of the legitimate state, right? So the Maroons, the independent communities are, that existed, they lived in remote areas, they did their own thing, they had their own community and all that stuff, despite the fact that slavery was still going on around them. And then I'm gonna talk about the creation of legitimate modern states and the exportation of abolition. So Haiti, Cuba, and Mexico, especially Haiti, were, were, were countries that were created and in their founding as an independent nation, they also simultaneously abolished slavery in their founding, all right? Cuba is, is a little, Cuba and Mexico aren't, are a little bit different than Haiti, but I put them all together, I grouped them all together and I'll, and I'll discuss later why they're all, they're all the same. And then the third category I have is slave revolts, which lead to the state finally realizing, well, damn, we better start making some changes or some reforms before you know, we lose all types of security and we, everything gets destroyed. So the slave revolts leading to the state taking action to officially abolish slavery. All right, so that's that's the three different categories I have here. So here, there's here's just a list of where Maroons exist. Maroons existed in probably almost every country that we have now, right? And some of them still exist to this day. But these are just a few <clears throat> of the more popular ones that I have on the list here that we're gonna talk about. So even if you go back as far as like the original um, 
Spanish that first landed in Santo Domingo, which is present-day Dominican Republic, way back in the 1500s. Um, there were Maroons that escaped those plantations, those sugar plantations there and escaped up into the mountains in those areas. But this first example I have here, there was a, a community known as San Miguel de Gualdape. And in the year, in the early 1520s, um, Lucas Vasquez de Ayon actually decided that he's gonna actually try to like, scope out some areas out there in North America to see if they can actually uh, find any slaves or find any, a possibility of living out there. So initially, I think it was in 1521, they sent some people out there they kidnapped some Native Americans from, from North America and then brought them back to Santo Domingo. But then the people, the messengers that went and ended up going up there and, and kidnapping the Native Americans from there, they said, well, it looks like it's a nice place to live. It looks, it looks like it's peaceful, it doesn't look too hostile. And so eventually, uh, Ajon decided he was gonna go and actually try to make a settlement up there. So he and 600 settlers, with some people estimate right around the number of it was about like a hundred Africans ended up going with them. But what ended up happening was while these settlers were there, right around like I think it was about between 550 or 650 settlers. I just kind of estimate here it was 600. Um, they end up going up there, and they experienced like a terrible winter. They, they were starving. They got they were a little cold, and then the the lower class people in the community ended up rising up and revolting against the, the upper class people in the community. So there was a mutiny there. And what ended up happening was when they were fighting amongst each other, the Africans, who were the ones who were enslaved, they decided to rise up and they committed arson and burned down everybody's house. And then they fled and ended up escaping and living amongst the Native Americans, people, people assume. No one, there's not really any record of what ended up happening to the Africans, but people say that this is the first example of Africans escaping in what's present day uh, North America, uh, United States, and creating their own independent maroon community, right? These hundred Africans or so, people are not sure about the exact number of them, but some people, I've heard some estimates say it's, it's close to a hundred of them. They say that they escaped and no one knows what happened to them, but they basically probably mixed in with the Native Americans and have been living out there. All right, so this is the first example of that. Um, the community and the, the Spanish community there, um, San Miguel de Valdape, ended up packing their bags. Only 150 of them survived, and then they just went back to uh, Santo Domingo. Another example is uh, San Lorenzo de los Negros. All right, now this African by the name of Yanga. He was actually born in, some people say he was born in Gabon, which is in West Central Africa, close to the, close to the Republic of Congo. He was transported into slavery right around the year, in the late 1560s. Right, when he arrived in, in Mexico, he was living in right around on a plantation near Veracruz. And over there, they used to cultivate sugar. They, used to, they worked on sugar plantations in those days in Veracruz. And in, in 1570, he escaped slavery with, with uh, dozens of other people who were enslaved and they, they established their own maroon community. And the Spanish refers to the maroon communities as Cimarrones and sometimes they refer to them as Palenque. The population of this maroon community was about 550. Um, between the 1570 and 1609, there were a number of battles and skirmishes between the Africans and the Spanish colonial government in Mexico, all right? As a matter of fact, they had become such a nuisance and their population continued to grow so much that people realized that the Yanga community was so strong that people started escaping plantations and seeking refuge there because they knew they would be safe because, because, of, because of how often that they would win the battles against the Spanish. And so, by the year uh, 1609, there was a major battle that happened in uh, San, Lorenzo, San Lorenzo de los Negros, which eventually led to the, uh, a treaty being signed. 
the treaty was signed, and then Yanga, the Yanga community, ended up becoming a legitimate community that was recognized by the Spanish colonial government. And so by 1618, they adopted the name San, San Lorenzo de los Negros. And, but then in the 20th century, I think it was in 1930, they officially changed the name to Yanga. So that Yanga community still exists to this day in Mexico. This is a statue that you see uh, representing uh, Yanga. The population today is, is over 15,000 people, right? There's another community in Colombia, San Basilio de Palenque. Uh, this African was also, he was from the Guinea region uh, where present day Guinea Bissau is the Portuguese transported him into slavery uh, back in the uh, 1500s. He eventually escaped slavery uh, in the late 1500s and then he established a, a maroon community right around 1603. And he eventually was killed, but a lot of his followers maintained themselves out in the woods for a long period of time. Just like the, just like in Mexico, there were sev several battles between the uh, Spanish colonial government and the Maroons until it got to the point where they decided that they were spending, the Spanish colonial government, just like they did in Mexico, just realized they were spending too much manpower on, and wasting too many resources trying to fight these Maroons. So they eventually signed a treaty with them and accepted them as a free independent community. And to this day, if you go to Colombia, near Cartagena, you find uh, this maroon community out there known, known as San Basilio de Palenque. All right. Uh, today, there are roughly around uh, 3,500 people living there. Another example of a major maroon community is Quilombo do Palmares, All right? Now this is in Brazil. And this maroon community consisted mostly of people who were from Angola, part of uh, West Africa. Now Quilombo is actually an Mbundu word. Mbundu is the language, is Mbundu is the language that they speak in Angola, which means like military camp. So because they had so much influence in Brazil, this, that was basically the name. And they refer, in Brazil, they refer to Maroon communities, not as Maroons, but as Quilombos. That's how strong the influence was of the, of the uh, Mbundu people in Brazil. But if you, if you understand the history of the transatlantic slave trade, Brazil was receiving a lot of Africans really early on. And they were working on sugar plantations in the Northeastern portion of Brazil in a place uh, known as Pernambuco, right there. And for a long time, all the Africans used to escape into the Amazon jungle. And the Africans started to form separate villages. And then these separate villages eventually joined together and formed a confederation of villages. The confederation of villages were known as Quilombo do Palmaj. And they said at its peak in the mid 1600s, they had somewhere upward of 30,000 uh, people with, living in the community. And they had like they, they constructed like walls and stuff and had defense mechanisms and had weaponry and had, and they used capoeira and warfare. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the, uh, the popular Brazilian dance, but it was actually, a, that was not only a dance, but it was a way that they actually fought in the martial art. And so all these things sustained these people as, as a free society. People were born, they lived and they died in this community. Uh, Zumbi or Nganga and Zumba was one of the, the, the leaders of the community who was actually born in the Congo. Zumbi was actually born in Palmas um, in this, I think it was like in the 1650s or something. And he eventually was captured and sold into slavery, but then he escaped again and he, he went back to Palmas. He eventually became the military leader of, of the community. And Nganga and Zuma was the president, but Nganga and Zuma was gonna sign a treaty with the Portuguese that was gonna compromise the community. So Zumbi decided to separate from them and, and, and do his own thing. And he ended up actually poisoning Nganga and Zumba and resisted Nganga and Zumba and his, his, you know, his allies and, and the Portuguese and them. But eventually uh, Zumbi was captured and killed in, in 1694. And the 
community, confederation of villages, as we know it, as Palmaj was, was crushed. But that didn't stop people from running away, and that didn't stop the Quilombos from still existing and forming. To this day, you can find, some people say there's 6,000 Quilombos all throughout Brazil to this day. Now, they're not like this large uniform community that they once were with, with Quilombo do Palmaj, but it's like disparate villages that you can find all throughout the forested region of Brazil to this day. Um, the constitution granted land titles in 1988. So these, they were basically for a very long time, for a hundred years or so, they were considered just like rebels or fugitives or the descendants of fugitives or squatters. But eventually in 1988, they had more of a progressive government which, which granted them land titles to the land that they were on. But there's still a lot of disputes over this, over this land to this day. So um, if you take all the Quilombos, right, the different communities, some of the communities are very small, just like, like a few dozen people, just extended families. Some of the communities consist of hundreds of, or even thousands of people, right? But if you take all of the, uh, the Ilombos, you put it together, they say that it's probably amounts to, to the size of Italy, right? So it's there's a lot of land and there's a lot of people that live in these, these independent communities throughout the day. Uh, they refer to them as Ilombolas, uh, and they say there's about 16 million Ilombolas in Brazil, right? And they usually live like way, way back in like the hinterland in the, uh, the forest region. But this guy, who's the president of Brazil, he is uh, trying to take the land away from the indigenous and the Quilombolas. So he's a little bit of a douche, but uh, you know, what are you gonna do? He doesn't feel like they have a right to the land. He doesn't really acknowledge their existence and big major corporations are, are trying to influence you know, the decisions of the government and taking their land away. So there's that's one of the disputes, that's one of the fights that's going on in Brazil right now is between the government that they have right now and the Latino border. All right. You have the, uh, the Maroons of Suriname. All right, so these Africans mostly came from the Gold Coast or, or what's present day Ghana. They're, or they're Akan people, so they're Ashanti. They speak the language of tree. They were transported uh, into slavery um, throughout the, uh, it's really started in the 1660s and all the way until about the 1760s into uh, Dutch, it was called Dutch Guyana, but now they refer to it as Suriname. So they eventually fought, they fled into the mountains and into the woods and they fought really long battles and eventually created their own freedom and created their own independent communities. Uh, by, 16, by 1762, they ended up signing a treaty with the Dutch. Uh, and some of the stipulations with a lot of these treaties consisted of if they, if they agreed to the treaty, then they couldn't no longer accept any more runaways into their community, right? That was, that was the terms of the treaty. So that was how it was with them. But even though they signed these things, I think, a lot of times you'll find historians saying that they didn't always follow the treaty to the letter, right? I think some of the African communities still continue to accept uh, runaways into the community, wow. despite the fact that they weren't supposed to under, under the stipulations of the treaty. Here's, there's a few, uh, a few communities. There's Saramaka community in Suriname, which has about 90,000 people. There is the Njuka community, which has about 90,000 people uh, today. And then here are these other ones here, Matawai, Akulu, uh, Paramaka, and Quinti. They all together have about 25,000, right? So it's, it's a very popular uh, Maroon community. It's the largest Maroon community in the world, they say, is in Suriname. And they, uh, it's, and, I, and they, they say it's the largest in the world. I, I say Brazil is, but some people, I think Brazil is a little bit different because 
they're really like, there were treaties signed, which kind of goes against my whole argument, but, but there were treaties signed that were basically like legitimizing them by the state. So they say that they are the largest maroon community. Um, the Quilombolas, a lot of them, where there were no treaty signed. They were just living out there independently and free. So there's a, oh, and there another thing, in recent times, there was, a, there, there was a civil war actually between the Maroons and Suriname and the government and throughout the 1980s and 90s. And then eventually this led to some, some land reform and eventually, they, there were land there were land disputes. I think it was like in 2007, where the government was coming in and trying to take their land and, and, and sell it off to the, the Chinese and some other corporations in some other country. And then eventually, this uh, they were able to win the, the win the battle in in the courts. They think the America has this uh, human rights court thing throughout the Americas, where they were able to win that case and then they end up getting their land back that they were trying to take that the corporations were trying to take. Now we're going to talk about Caribbean Maroon. So there's the Garifuna. The Garifuna is the, uh, they're basically like, they were born out of a mixture of enslaved Africans and Carib Indians in the West Indies, in the island of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, right? So there's an island called Bekwe. Now, this, the way the story goes, they say, they used to say that there was a, a ship in 1675 that was carrying 400 enslaved Africans on it, and it crashed on the island of Bekwe. And they used to say that, you know, these Africans, they, they got off the ship and, uh, and they found a way to get to the mainland in St. Vincent, and then they conquered all the Carib women, and they kind of mixed in like that, and that's how the story goes. But they say that, uh, a historian by the name of Michael Creighton, he makes the argument that that's probably it didn't probably didn't happen like that. And there was there was a a British individual who had interest in the slave trade who made that argument to just basically make it seem like that the, the Garifuna didn't have rights to the land. They were conquerors just as the British were. And so what Michael Creighton argues, the historian, he's basically saying that they didn't actually go and conquer the land, but it was a gradual thing. They basically all the enslaved Africans who were escaping into the woods in St. Vincent, they just eventually mixed in with the Caribs. And, you know, eventually this is where you have the Black Caribs. But the Black Caribs are known as the Garifuna. They fought tooth and nail for decades all throughout uh, St. Vincent when the French were there and then when the British came in. But eventually, by, uh, by 1797, they were actually exiled because of the fact that they continued to fight too hard and, and they exiled the Garifuna to Central America. So you can find the descendants of the Garifuna to this day in Honduras, Belize, Guatemala, and uh, Nicaragua, all right? Uh, today, there are some 65,000 Garifuna between those four countries, all right? And they, they re retain a lot of their African customs they retained a lot of their, uh, their, their Carib customs, et cetera. And they're phenotypically black, right? And you can see in these pictures, right? Even though they're, they're known as black Caribs because they, they mixed in with the Carib Indians, but they're, they're obviously phenotypically black. Then there's the Jamaican Maroons, right? Now, this is another example of a group of Africans uh, between the years of the 1670s and 1690s. Well, I, I have the wrong number there. I meant to say 1670s and 1690s, the, uh, there was a series of slave plantations on the western side of the island that ended up going up in flames as, as a result of slave revolts. Some of the sugar plantations had 500 slaves that revolted and just fled into the mountains. Some of them had 100 or 200. But between those years, because the British, once they took over the island from the Spanish, continued to import a massive amount of Africans from the same region of Africa, mostly the Gold Coast. So a lot of them spoke the same language. They ended up rising up, getting their freedom, and they fought a series of wars against the British colonial government 
leading to them signing a treaty in 1739. All right, but the thing about the Jamaican Maroons is not only did they have to ex not accept new runaways, but part of the stipulation in the treaty was that they had, they had to accept slavery. So they had to also serve as the island's defense force. So if there was ever a slave uprising on the, on the uh, plantations in Jamaica, the Maroons had to be deployed to, to quell that, that uprising. And they typically did. So in, in 1760, when there was the tacky slave revolt in uh, Jamaica, guess who was deployed to fight them? It, it was the Maroons themselves. So some people look at the Jamaican Maroons as being a little bit like sellout kind of thing. Um, but eventually they would even rise up against the colonial government. Most of them would in 1796. And they end up exiling a lot of the, uh, the Maroons, not a lot of them, but a big portion of them in 1796. And they sent the, the, the Jamaican Maroons that they exiled in 1796, they end up sending them off to uh, Nova Scotia. There's about 600 of them. And then from Nova Scotia, they weren't doing so well. So after a few years, they sent them to Sierra Leone. So to this day, you can find the descendants of the Maroons who fought for their own freedom in Jamaica. You can find them in Sierra Leone. Uh, they have their own community there in West Africa. This is this lady right here. Her name is Queen Nanny. She was uh, she was known to be like this very fierce and intelligent fighter, but she was also known to have these magical powers, according to Jamaican folklore. She's uh, they say that she was an Obia practitioner, and Obia is like you know they call that the Europeans refer to it as witchcraft, but it has its origins in Africa, and they said that. She was able to catch bullets with her breasts. That's where the story goes. And then shoot them back out at you. I didn't make that up. And then here's, uh, this is Dominica. This is what I did my dissertation on. And I wrote an article on it. I'm writing a book on it right now. This is a Maroon community that existed in the mountains from 1763 to uh, 1814. Now these Maroons did not sign treaties with the government and they made sure that they were actually formed an alliance with the enslaved in the plantation. They actually, and I, this is what I say, there, in, the, in the year 1814, there were 800 slave or 800 Africans listed as Maroon in Dominica, but there were about 20,000 enslaved Africans on the plantation. But as I was going through the, doing my research on the Maroons in this place, there was communication between the Maroons and the enslaved in the plantations. And they had this secret trade network thing going on where if the Maroons needed some salt or some guns or some, some tools from the plantation, those enslaved people on the plantation would provide that for them in exchange for ground provisions because the Maroons in the mountains were like expert farmers. And so they would they would provide them with the yams and the provisions and all that stuff from the mountains if they were hungry. And in exchange, they would provide the things that they couldn't get in the mountains that they had on the plantation. So it was this secret trade going on. And it got to the point in Dominica that you, you would, on any given day, you would see slaves on the plant, the enslaved on the plantation in the mountains. And you'd see the people in the mountains on the plantations. And so it was like, a, like an all out rebellion in that island that uh, lasted for several years. And there was nothing that they could really do about it because they, uh, the Igbo, most of the Africans that were enslaved in Dominica were of Igbo descent. And uh, the Igbo had no fear of dying. That's just because they, they believed in the transmigration of the soul. And they didn't believe in, they believed in this the philosophy like Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. They did not want to live under somebody else's uh, yoke or somebody else's thumb. They wanted to live free or die trying, right? But, if, but the way that they were actually able to get them is the governor Ansley at the time, who they ended up bringing to Dominica in 1814, he realized that the Igbo had this understanding of the universe that they believed their soul would transmigrate back amongst their families if they die. But 
if their bodies were mutilated after death, then your soul does not live on. And so the governor of Ainsley, when he learned this about the Igbo, what he started to do was he started to burn the bodies of the people he executed. And this deterred the, uh, the Igbo to continue to fight. So, but they, it was a, it was a 50 year long uh, run that they had. But eventually, like if you, if you go to Dominica today, they still have that same free spirit that they, that I think the Maroons had back then. There's also uh, this Florida, Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose, was a was a community that was established in the uh, right just north of Saint Augustine. If you go all the way back to the year um, seven or 1693, before that year, a lot of Africans that were being transported into South Carolina as slaves would escape South Carolina and they would flee down into Florida. Florida was Spanish. And Florida was, even though it was Spanish, they weren't really practicing slavery like that, right? Not like a lot of the other Spanish colonies like Santo Domingo or, or Mexico were doing. It was more like a military base. And so what they realized was, well, we can actually, the Spanish realized that we can actually use the labor or the people that are coming down into Florida. So they started to promote the idea. So then the edict of 1693 said any African that escapes the British plantations in South Carolina and comes down into Florida, Will be have will have their freedom recognized as long as they serve in our military. So they established a town just north of St. Augustine called Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose. For short, they called it Fort Mose, and it was established in uh, 1738. And this was when you had a number of Africans just fleeing South Carolina from Florida. Right, even the Stone of Rebellion was inspired by by the creation of this town. But the thing is this, um, not, all, not all the Africans went to live in this town. There was only about a hundred people living in this, a hundred Africans living in the town. A lot of the African-Americans that fled the plantations of South Carolina and went into Florida, some of them created their own independent communities and some of them allied themselves with the, uh, the Native Americans that were down there. There is a, a couple of examples here. For instance, there's the uh, African Americans escaped down into Florida um, in the early 1800s. There was the, the Patriot War, which occurred at the same time as the War of 1812. And they sometimes call it the Other War of 1812 because at the time, President, John, President uh, James Madison had agreed as well as Secretary of State James Monroe agreed that they were gonna actually allow American citizens to go and invade Florida and try to bring back their slaves and conquer certain parts of North Florida. But they quickly, the African Americans in Florida quickly repelled this invasion and the whole thing was a failure. And so something that the president and the, and the Secretary of State initially supported, the Southern planters going down there invading, they had to quickly rescind because they were like, y'all are just wasting our money and our time because these Africans in Florida were fighting harder to protect their freedom in that area than some, than some of the Native Americans were in Florida. And so after the War of 1812, when the British had a fort in Apalachicola, Florida, they abandoned the fort. A lot of the African Americans that were escaping to Florida started to escape to this place called Negro. They, call, they ended up calling it Negro Fort, but it was a British fort with weapons and all that stuff and cannons. And they stayed, they resided there for uh, about a year before the US military ends up going out there and attacking the fort, eventually uh, resulting in the death of about 270 African Americans when they shot a cannon at the fort. Um, the African-Americans tried to fight back, but many of them just had to flee. And the ones that survived ended up escaping and going farther south into Florida and creating maroon communities farther south. The thing about Florida is like, when we don't really learn this history is that they were, Florida was really a, a free safe haven for, for African-Americans. And we learn we learn a lot about the, like a lot of the slave revolts that failed, 
where like, you know, the guy gets executed or gets hanged and all that type of stuff. But we never learned about the ones where, you know, African-Americans were able to escape into an area and create generational freedom, right? Or not just you are free, but you, you're able to raise a family and they're able to raise a family who raises a family. Like that's what Florida was. African-Americans had gone down and Florida had done this. But it wasn't until once you had the expansion of the Cotton Kingdom in the South and you had the annexation of more and more territories, Andrew Jackson and these guys, they started wanting to conquer more and more land for the cotton institution. And so Florida became one of those, those, those targets. And so even though African had lived free in Florida for all these years, now you're starting to see them crack down on uh, the runaways. And so you had what they call the second Seminole War. The first Seminole War was right after the, the Battle of Negro Fort in 1817 and 1818. But the Second Seminole War was 1835 to 1842. And they say this war was actually blacker than the first Seminole War. Uh, General Jessup, you guys know Lake Jessup, General is named after General Jessup, who was one of the generals who was deployed out there and was actually kind of, and he was a, an Indian fighter and a slave catcher, essentially. He was fighting, he was, he claimed that the Africans were fighting harder than the Indians were. To, to save this territory. There were about 1,300 Black participants in the Second Seminole War. Uh, they fought so hard that by the year 1838, the, they agreed to sign a treaty with the, uh, the US troops that were deployed out there. And they, they were given a pass to go and settle out West. 500 Blacks ended up immigrating westward. 250 of them, 250 of them immigrated under the treaty. And not only that, as these black Seminoles and these Maroons were fighting, they also liberated a lot of the, the enslaved people on the plantation on the new plantations that were instituted out there at the time. So there was a it was a joint effort. And you see these circles here on this on this map? They represent the side, the magnitude of slave revolts. We all we, we've all heard of. Nat Turner, look how small that is. A lot of us has heard, have heard of Gabriel Prosser, right? But look at this one in Florida here. This is including the Black, the black Seminoles, the independent Maroons, and the, the enslaved on the plantations that all participated in this war, the Second Seminole War. And you know what's the interesting thing about this? is unlike any other slave revolt, the enslaved African-Americans that have participated in this rebellion did not get punished for this. And I'm not sure exactly why. Most cases they would, you know, they would execute and hang or banish or exile the people, but they didn't do that. They put them right back on the plantations where they came from. But the tradition of running away still continued throughout Florida, despite the fact that it was being taken over by the United States. The African-Americans that end up going to Oklahoma, Native Americans tried to enslave them out in Oklahoma. So they end up escaping down into Mexico eventually. And to, and to this day, there's a community of uh, Mexicans known as the Mascobos, who are the descendants of the Black Seminole who, ran, who initially ran away from South Carolina, mixed in with the Indians, went out to Oklahoma, and now they're in, in uh, Mexico. And there are other communities, maroon communities that ended up, ended up escaping to other places like Andros Island in the Bahamas. You can find descendants of the Black Seminoles there as well. But they found, they found free spaces for themselves. The Mascogos of Mexico in a town called El Nacimiento and Coahuila, Mexico. And this is the community today. Their ancestors fought for their freedom. There's also the community of, I'm gonna try to speed through this guy, sorry. There's also the, uh, the Great Dismal Swamp. Thousands lived there through, through time. 
Um, it sits right there between the borders of North Carolina and Virginia. Uh, it's about 1 million acres of land where African Americans had fled Virginia plantations, North Carolina plantations, and found their freedom in there. And even at the, and, and they had like generational, generational freedom too. It's not just like escaping for a day and, and, and leaving, but it was a pretty impregnable kind of uh, environment there. So in this area, when the Civil War was going on, a lot of the black colored troops that went in and were trying to recruit, they went to the Great Dismal Swamp to recruit troops for the Civil War. And they, some of them ended up participating in that as well. All right. Now, this is where, uh, when abolition movements coincide with the independence movements. So we talked about maroon communities. Now we're gonna talk about when abolition movements coincide with independence movements. There's Haiti, there's Mexico, there's Cuba. All of these countries, their founding fathers are also abolitionists, okay? In the United States, our founding fathers are really not mostly abolitionists. So I think that's that's the thing that I'm trying to, to show here. Their, their fight for freedom was, it, it coincided with their fight for abolition as well. So we all know about the Haitian Revolution, right? Uh, they, they started importing like thousands upon thousands of Africans into Saint-Domingue, uh, the French colony, uh, the Western side of Hispaniola in the 1780s, right? And then by 1789, there was the French Revolution. In 1791, the Africans rise up and they start to take over the, the colony. And it gets to the point where the British and the Spanish are looking on the sidelines like, wow, the French are really losing this colony. And, and then the, the Spanish and the British, they go in and try to take it. As they're doing this, the French realize, well, if we don't side with the, the Africans, then we might lose the entire colony. So, so the French decide, we gotta, make, we gotta make an alliance with the Africans. So what do they do? They abolish slavery. Um, they eventually abolish slavery and 1793 at first, and then in 1794, they make it official with the, in the French assembly, abolishing slavery throughout the empire. But as they do this, and as they're, they're becoming pretty victorious, by 1799, Napoleon Bonaparte comes into power, and then he takes over, and then he tries to reinstitute slavery in the French empire. And so now they're sending troops back down to re-enslave the Africans, so then now they have to fight again. And so they already kicked out the Spanish, they already kicked out the British, and now they have to try to defeat the French again. And so they eventually do, and this is Toussaint Louverture. He's he was the uh, he was like the general, the leader of the revolt. Uh, not to take any credit away from the people that did the grassroots work or anything like that, but he's kind of like the symbol of it. By 1804, they end up getting their their freedom, uh, January 1st, and they abolish slavery in their constitution. And not only that, but they also were exporters of slavery, or of abolition, because they actually went over to Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic, the other side. And by 1822, they abolished slavery on that side of the island. Not only that, they encouraged African-Americans from the United States that they can come there and, and, uh, and escape slavery in the United States. And if they can arrive in Haiti, then they can get free land and, and pick themselves up as free people there. Not only that, Simon Bolivar, when he was engaging in his revolutionary movements in Latin America, he said they asked the the uh, the Haitian government for some assistance. They said, "We'll help you if you abolish your slavery or work towards abolition." So they were all of, they were universal emancipationists. They weren't only concerned with 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 ending slavery for themselves. But this is where um, the young lady made a comment here about how the uh, the colonial powers tried to basically still make money off of Haiti. After Haiti got its freedom, and the interesting thing about this is there were two, there were like two classes of people. There was a class of people in Haiti that typically were born in Haiti. Many of them were uh, probably had like higher rankings and in, in, in slave status or even were probably even freeborn. But they, but they wanted to make Haiti a, a modern state. They wanted it to be recognized by 
by the the European colonial powers. They wanted because they wanted to be able to engage in trade and be able to make profits in that way. And so when France said, "We're not going to recognize your independence unless you pay reparations," that elite class in Haiti decided to to submit to that, and they they paid rep reparations. But the vast, the masses of people in Haiti did, weren't even concerned with being recognized by outsiders, and they weren't even be, they weren't even really concerned with being legitimized. So a lot of them created a system called the Lakou system, L A K O U, which was basically a maroon within the modern state, right? And so, in order for Haiti to pay back reparations to France for liberating themselves. They had to start taxing people and they had to start uh, forcing people on plantations. So the, the, the Haitian state itself, um, seeing freedom through the eyes of the state did not necessarily freedom in that sense. It was the people who, who abandoned the idea of statism and went and created their own independent communities called the Lacou in Haiti. So those are the ones that found true freedom. All right, because the system was going to try to make put you right back on the plantations so they can pay the so they can uh, raise money, raise revenue to pay back France. And I believe it was like they they didn't pay back France completely until 1947. And it was uh like 21 billion dollars worth of money. Vicente Guerrero was another one. He was a uh, he was born in 1783. He uh, he rose up in the rankings in the military, and then he ended up fighting against the, uh, the Spanish and the revolutionary movements. And then eventually, uh, the Mexico got its independence in 1821. But he became the second president of Mexico. He's actually considered an Afro Mexican because his his dad is half black, half white. And his mom is is Native American, and so it's something we don't really learn about too much. But he was the he helped abolish slavery under his his presidency as the second president of Mexico. He abolished slavery in 1829. Right, he was hated for that by a lot of people, but uh, he did what he had to do. All right. And then in Cuba, you have Antonio Maceo, who was a, uh, the Cuba is very interesting because they were importing a lot of Africans into Cuba straight from the African continent all the way to the 1860s. Uh, but in 1868 to 1878, they have what they have what they call the 10 years war in Cuba. It was a war of independence. But there were the, the people on the, the white Cubans on the east side of the island had old money and were more concerned about getting liberation from Spain than they were about continuing their profits in slavery. And see, one of the reasons why the people that wanted to continue their profits in slavery did not want independence is because they wanted the security of the crown, the protection of the crown. And so the Western side of Cuba, on the other hand, those whites on that side of Cuba, that was new money, those people that were continuously profiting from the importation of slaves. And they did not want separation from the crown. So the people on the east side of the island, they freed their slaves and they fought against the crown. This last, this war lasted from 1868 to 1878. When this war failed, there was another war that came about in 1879 to 1880 called La Guerra Chiquita. This war was bigger and blacker than the previous one. All right. Now this, the Africans really fighting for their own freedom. And it was like a kind of like a rainbow coalition of freedom. And in, in Cuba's War of Independence, you had black people rising to the high ranks of general and things like that. Antonio Maceo was one of them, okay? Now it got to the point where that the blacks were fighting so hard in these wars of independence that the Spanish decided to throw them a bone and say, look, we'll give you guys your freedom. By 1886, well, 1881, they had the, uh, the womb law, which was gonna gradually abolish slavery in Cuba. Then by 1886, they completely abolished it. But this didn't stop the black Cubans from uniting with the white Cubans uh, to fight for their independence. So there was another war from 1895 to 1898, which resulted in the independence of Cuba. Um, Antonio Maceo is one of the founding fathers of Cuba. To this day, you can find like statues and stuff of him. I thought I had it up here. I guess I didn't put it up here. And uh, he's, uh, 
there's two statues. There's one in Havana and there's one in Santiago de Cuba and the other side. Now, this last section, we're almost done. Uh, we're going to talk about African influence and, in, well, there's two last sections. African influence and in the abolition of slavery. I'm, I got, what, 14 minutes left? All right. I'll be quick. There's African influence in the abolition of slavery uh, and in the British West Indies, all right? So there is Dominica, the case of Dominica that we just kind of discussed recently. And there is the uh, case of Barbados, Bogusa, there's the case of Demerara, and then there's the case of Samuel Sharp Rebellion in, um, in Jamaica. Now, Typically, when you see the uh, like emancipation in in British West Indies, it's uh, you always have this guy right here, like looks like he's begging for his freedom, right? He's on his knees, right? Or even when you look at an emancipation statue in Washington D.C. with Abraham Lincoln, they always look like they're on their knees begging. Well, I'm, I, this section I'm trying to show that the way legal emancipation came about was never but through begging. It was, it was through fighting, right? And so it, this is a, a quote here from Emiliano Zapata. Better to die on your feet than to live on your knees, right? But they're always showing us these images. I think it does something to us psychologically. There's two books that talk about this phenomena uh, throughout the West Indies. Um, the Tacky Rebellion and the Amelioration Act. So in 1760, there was a huge slave rebellion in Jamaica that caused the parliament to talk about like, a, like assuaging or, or ameliorating the conditions of slavery in the British West Indies, right? Just so people don't revolt so much. Well, by the 1790s, they started to even talk about abolishing the transatlantic slave trade. But then remember in the 1790s when the British were, were going to go and uh, and try to take over Saint-Domingue from, from, from the French, which is present-day Haiti, the British kind of postponed the, ab the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade talk because they thought they might get a new colony. But once they realized they lost it, that's when they brought the whole discussion back. And so they said, they realized, well, if we abolish the transatlantic slave trade, because there's the people were under the this this understanding that only Africans rebel, only Africans revolt. And not realizing that, no, people who were born in, in, into slavery also rebelled as well. So the thinking was, if we abolish the transatlantic slave trade and we're not bringing any new Africans in, because Taki was an African, uh, Busa was an African. All these people were Africans, born in the African continent. If we stop that trade and we grow our Africans home, homegrown Africans on plantations, then we would have more control over their minds, we'll have more control over, them, over what they know and what they do, and they'll be less likely to revolt. So you have, no, because no one wants a Haiti to happen, right? No one wants the whole entire island to be lost to a bunch of Africans. The, throughout the 1790s, the Caribbean was revolting like crazy. And so this is why they eventually pressed for this abolition when they did. All right, so you have Haiti from 1791, 1804. You have Jamaica with the Maroons, 1796, 1797. You have St. Vincent and their Gatifuna, 1796, 1797. Grenada had the Fedon Rebellion where thousands of Africans had risen up in 1795, 1796. Dominica had their slave revolts in 1791, 1795, and, and the mutiny in 1802. Martinique throughout the 1790s, St. Lucia in 1794, Curacao with the Tula Rebellion in 1795. All, during the French Revolution and Haitian Revolution, there were re rebellions going on throughout the Caribbean. And so by 1807, they put a stop to the importation of Africans. Because if you look at this graph right here, what does it show you? It shows you that. The, the increase in African importations was constantly going up every decade. And it culminated during this time here, right? Leading up to the year 1800. 
It's just simple math. If you, if you keep bringing in more people and you're continuously outnumbered, and these people in your and you're enslaving them in the most harshest of conditions, they're just gonna they're gonna snap and they're gonna rise up. And this is a perfect example. These rebellions in the 1790s is a perfect example of the numbers of the increase. So then they they shied away from it for a while. So they're thinking, okay, we abolish slavery, the transatlantic slave trade, and we keep them homegrown Africans, then there would be no, no issues there. The British were convinced that homegrown Creole population would reduce slave revolts, but it didn't happen. Dominica continued to rebel. rebel. Barbados had a, a rebellion, the Busa Rebellion. They committed mostly arson. Uh, the rebellion was initially started relatively peacefully, and they had 400 followers. But once the colonial troops Started to, they, they deployed colonial troops on the uh, the rebels. This is when the rebels started to resort to guerrilla warfare tactics to fight back. But in the end, they only ended up killing two colonial troops, but over 200 of the freedom fighters were, were executed. And 170 were deported. This is, this is in Barbados, 1816, all right? Now, Few years later, now this is a this is a big deal. This is one of the major slave conspiracies. Where they like they literally like burned like a one third of the plantations down to the ground in the island. And so like, this is a big deal. A lot of people lost a lot of money in this. Demerara, which is in present day Guyana, South America, same similar situation. Uh, it was led by Akan slaves initially from the Gold Coast in 1823. 10,000 joined a relatively peaceful revolt. It was peaceful because they didn't like really start killing people, but they locked up all the all the own the slave owners and all that stuff and put them basically put them on house arrest and demanded some some freedoms. But as a result, they deployed troops from all different areas and and they executed uh hundreds of them. Samuel Sharp, another major rebellion. A few years after that, this one's in Jamaica. December uh, 27, 1831, there were 60,000 freedom fighters out of the, th out of the 300,000 enslaved people in Jamaica. This one lasted 10 days. They killed 12 whites. They burned down plantations like crazy. And this was probably the biggest threat of them all, the, the largest slave rebellion in the British West Indies. And uh, 300 freedom fighters are in, in getting killed. But this was in 18, this lasted from 1831 to January, 1832. Guess what happens a year later? Abolition of slavery. 1833 Parliament passes the Abolition Act. 1834, August 1st, slavery is abolished. The formerly enslaved are to work four years of apprenticeship. 1838, slavery is completely abolished. All right. So even in the British West Indies, they fought tooth and nail for their freedom. In the USA, this is the last section here. There's always been a tradition of running away. You had slave revolts, you had Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad. You had the Maroons in Florida, you had the Great Dismal Swamp, you had attacks on plantations, you had attacks from the Great Dismal Swamp, you had attacks from Florida, you had all that going on. As soon as, oh, and there's, here's a book by uh, Herbert Aftercur called American Negro Slave Revolts, which details like thousands of conspiracies and revolt, or hundreds of conspiracy and revolts going on throughout the United States. Harriet Tubman, Liberated 300 between 1848-1858. She participated in the Civil War as a nurse and spy, led, tro led troops into battle in South Carolina, liberating another 700,000 enslaved people. And uh, this brings us to, to Mr. Lincoln. He was elected as a Republican. He was the party, the Republican Party was born out of a failed Whig uh, and Free Soiler and Liberty parties. The party was mostly of industrialization. He didn't believe in, ex in, in expanding uh, slavery out into the new territories that we were gaining. But that didn't necessarily make him an abolitionist, which is one of the misconceptions. Now, here are some Lincoln quotes of the past. I have always hated slavery. I think it as much as any abolitionist. He said this in 1858. 
He said, now I confess myself as belonging to that class in the country who contemplates slavery as a moral, social, and political evil. He also says, if slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. Right? These are typically the quotes that we hear about Lincoln. But Lincoln also said other things. He says, what next? Free them and make them politi politically and socially our equals? My own feelings will not admit, to, uh, admit of this. And if mine would, we well know that those of the great mass of white people will not. 1864. He also said in 1858, I had no thought in the world that I was doing anything to bring about a political and social equality of the black and white races. Lincoln also said, I have no purpose. This is what he said when he was already elected in his inaugural address. I have no purpose directly or indirectly to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Lincoln also said in 1862 to a letter of Horace Greeley after the Civil War already started, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or destroy slavery. If I can save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. This is a private letter to Horace Greeley. So this is where I say, when the war broke out, Lincoln's intentions were to save the Union above all things. Now, despite the fact that you had laws prohibiting blacks from joining the military, once the war broke out between the blacks and the whites, the black, I mean, between the South and the North, the blacks end up fleeing their masters and fighting on the side of the Union soldiers. And they insisted upon helping. Right, because your enemy is enemy is your ally. They said, look, we want to fight with you guys. And so thousands of African Americans escaped their masters once the war broke out. And it, it was really up to individual union generals to whether they were going to accept the runaways or not. And many of them did, especially in certain battles that we were losing in the beginning of the war. The union was losing in the beginning of the war. Of course, you can accept all the help you can get. Runaways insist upon helping as spies, guides, soldiers, nurses, laborers, pioneers, whatever they can do. And eventually, 200,000 black men served in the Union Army. By 1863, Lincoln's tone changes. Now he says, he issues the Emancipation Proclamation. By the summer, he gives his famous Gettysburg Address, talking about all men are created equal. And the narrative of the war officially changes. But even in his uh, Emancipation Proclamation, he didn't even free the slaves in states that didn't rebel. He left those, those states untouched. So hundreds of thousands of slaves remained enslaved legally. But eventually we'd have the 13 minute pass. And that is all my 90 slides. Sorry I had to rush at the end, guys. We got a minute left. <laughs> Woo! Are y'all there? Yep. All right, cool. It's working all right. fabulous. I thought that presentation delved into things I had not thought about. I give you a clapping hand. There it is. <laughs> virtually and graphically. Just mind bending and mind blowing. And that so encourages me to look so much deeper. Um, you know, when you're talking about legitimization and what reality really is, it's just excellent. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Anybody have any questions? I have a question. There were there were two books you showed in the PowerPoint earlier towards the end. Could you tell us what those were again, please? So this one is uh, it's Caribbean slave revolts, the British abolitionist movement. It's okay. by uh, Galen Matthews. Yeah, you see that right there. Yep. Thank so, you. 
and yeah, in this book, she talks about how when the slaves were rebelling in uh, in Barbados and in Demerara, in Guyana and in Jamaica, the abolitionists in London kind of like use that to explain like, look, you see, you see how see how wrong this is. You see how you know these they're rising up and and they basically kind of played off each other. And the enslaved also knew what Parliament was talking about and what the abolitionists were talking about. And so it was like this back and forth thing that was playing off of each other. And so, which eventually led to the legal liberation of the enslaved African Americans. So, she, and she talks specifically about the Barbados, the Demerara, and Jamaica rebellions. And the other one, well, I don't have it here, but it's the book is called Revolutionary Emancipation, and it's by Claudius Fergus. Claudius Fergus. Okay. Yeah. And Claudius Fergus makes the argument that a lot of the British reformers weren't even really concerned really with the freedom of the African Americans, but it was more about maintaining security in the mm -hmm. islands. So you still want to make all the profits that you can off of off of the people, but you want to make sure that they just submit. And so at first they were thinking, oh well, if we ameliorate some of the conditions on the plantations provide them with food, provide them with health care, provide them with clothing, then maybe they'll, they'll, they'll stay put. But they're still rebelling. So they say, okay, maybe it's because they're Africans and we stop importing the Africans, maybe they'll stop rebelling. And they're still rebelling. They're being, they're, they're, you know, they're being, even the ones that are being born in Jamaica or born in the West Indies, they're still rebelling. So then it's like, well, damn, well, maybe we just abolish slavery, but not really about slavery, let's just call it abolition, mm -hmm. and we have an apprenticeship movement, and then maybe they'll stop. But then they did that. But then after, even after the apprenticeship was abolished in 1838, they made it really hard for African, people of African descent to own land in the British West Indies. If, they're, if, you own, if you can own land, and you can be free. You can truly be independent, because land is the basis of independence. Mm -hmm. They really wanted to, be, to turn them into wage laborers that they can still exploit. Uh, and it, which is still going on, you know, to this day in a lot of these countries. Mm, that's a shame. Yeah. yeah. When can we expect your book? <laughs> oh, uh, well, I've been working on it all the time, man. Uh, end of this year. No, 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 next year. Next year, realistically. But I, I'll, I'll have it all written by the, I'll probably have it all written by the summertime, but you know how those things go. You got to like send it to the editor and they got to go back and do all that stuff. So probably next year. Thank you so much, Neil. This was so informative. I, I've got a question. Uh, sorry, my dog barking. I don't know if you can hear that. But anyway, um, I know that there's a number of um, movements. Actually, Veneta uh, started a petition to you know have accurate American history taught in the public schools. Do you know, like, like, are there schools teaching accurate history? How, you know, are, I don't even know, like, are curriculums out there for public, you know, um, for us to know what's being taught? Like, how do, we, how do we make some changes? What would you suggest? I don't know, man. I, I know that, like, I always hear people say that Florida and the South is, like, the most backwards when it comes to, and I lived in, I lived in D.C. for, a few years, I was at Howard, and I did notice that they had, they did have a little bit more of a progressive kind of uh, academic curriculum. Um, so I don't know, maybe we can like learn from some of those people that go to some of those colleges and those, like Howard University, for instance. I'll tell you, there's one thing that I got from up there was like it just kind of just shifted my my way of thinking, you know, because I I grew up here in Florida. And I didn't even know about the Seminole, the, the Black Seminoles being here. <laughs> I go up there and they're teaching me about the Black Seminoles and they're teaching me about Eatonville and they're teaching me about all these things. And I'm like, wow, interesting. So I don't know, we just gotta, we gotta we just look for it. We gotta seek it and then just implement it in our classes. But in terms of like there being like one uniform institution, I, I don't really know of any. I guess I'm just thinking, you know, for so many of us that are talking like, you know, to be almost 55 and first learning, you know, literally within the last year, I would say I've learned more about American history than I have my entire life put together. Wow. So, like, I, it needs to be earlier, like we need to have it not even I mean, it's important in college, but it needs to be taught in 
school um, during, you know, the formative years. I mean, this is... Absolutely. That's one of the things that I, I hated history growing up. Like, I would never do well in my history classes. But I would always go home and watch documentaries, and I, not reali realizing that that's I'm watching history documentaries, but I hate history class. And I was like, yeah, they just got to incorporate things that are more relatable uh, to people. Thank you again. This is just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. You did a very good job. Thank you so much for presenting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Lily yeah. says, I would think it, I would think it also have to be multi multifaceted and encompass other disciplines as well. Yeah, I know you're right. Yeah, it's definitely. It's one of those things where like I, I try to teach my kids this way as well. Um, without really because I really try not to talk about race when I do it, but I just I just show images. Because images is everything. I don't like keeping them confined to like, oh, you are black and this is what black people do or not. But as like, I show them images, I give them books of people that look like them who are heroic, you know? And your subconscious mind is more powerful than the conscious mind. So you don't have to tell somebody, oh, this is the black person that did this, but you just show them a picture and they'll they will register in their head and be like, okay. Like, you know what, they won't even know that they're, what they're thinking, but it'll just have more of a positive effect on them. I didn't, I, I didn't really understand why I didn't like history growing up. Because uh, I couldn't really verbalize it or I couldn't consciously understand it, you know? Mm -hmm. But just because you can't verbalize something as a 10-year-old doesn't mean that it's not affecting you. It wasn't until I got older that I realized, okay, yeah, this is why I don't like history. It's because all the whites are heroes and all the, the blacks are like just a side note or, or the anti-hero because if Thomas Jefferson is a hero and he justifies the ownership of slaves, then what does that make the slave? You know? So it's a female uh, raised in the British West Indies. I was not raised where the blacks were the enemy. I was hmm. raised where the blacks were the hero. Every day I drove to school, I passed a statue with a statue. fist in the air. Yeah. So when I came to this country and I saw the perspective that history had shaped Black people with hair, it was it was shocking for me. Yeah. Because, you know, it's it's been a while now. I mean, I've been here 30 years, but that's a profound effect into who you become. So unless we get these kinds of things that you're suggesting, these images that you do with your kids, unless we get those into our heads and our spirits of our young people, young people, then this is something that's going to be carried for many, many, many more generations. You know, having, you know, and it's been a struggle for me raising black children in this country because it's hard for me to do that when the environment is teaching them different things, you know. Mm -hmm. It's so it's been a challenge for me having been raised in a country of black people. 95% of Barbados is of African heritage. Yeah. You know, they're mixing of the mulatto races and whatnot. But at the end of the day, we view ourselves and we are a black country. And so we were raised, our history was taught that the revolts, they weren't called revolt um, rebellions for us. You know, they were they were good things. Yeah. And that's so counter to what yeah. is taught here. Yeah. So, it's such an interesting, and I myself, I'm learning so much about African American history, which I didn't learn because I yeah. learned, you know, co British colonial, but, you know, Barbados become, became independent in 1966. So from then on, we took ownership of our own history. But what is really sad, and I have a cousin who's a historian in Barbados, and what is really sad is so much of what the Black history was, the experience was, is lost because they weren't, literacy wasn't encouraged. And so a lot of it, you know, even in my family was passed down through spoken words, through stories, through food. So yeah. much of my African heritage, the history I know is the food I still cook to this day, yeah. right? And it's, it's, it's sad that a lot of what, even what you spoke of today is really just probably snippets of mm -hmm. what 
actually occurred. Yeah, yeah. We don't have written record of that. You know, yeah. so moving forward, that's something I think we should also focus on. Even with this Black Lives Matter movement, let's write this down. Let's document this for history so that the story of, of the transitions that are happening or trying to happen now are told in yeah. their full truth. And you make, you make a good point. The, the Maroons, they say Maroon history is the most difficult thing to, to truly document because of the fact that their survival was based on not being detected, <laughs> right? So you can't, they, they, there's probably so many other more communities out there that we never had any knowledge of, or that we still don't have any knowledge of, that live probably deep in the Amazon somewhere. But their their very essence was to not be detected. And so, you know, how do you how do you really talk about that? How do you how do you even document those kinds of things? But you know, there's there's ways historians do. Like they make their estimates and they make their guesses. And uh, you can't always just rely upon. That's why I say you got to take an anti-positivist approach to approaching history. You can't just say, oh, only legitimize the documentation of the colonial government and say that's the only history that's real. What about the oral histories? Or what about the uh, word of mouth or you know, these kinds of things? Like there's other ways of coming to the truth, you know. And and I think that's very important. Yeah, yeah, you make a good point. I wanted to make a comment on the idea that freedom is something you continually fight for. And it just makes me think about how, even though technically we're not slaves anymore, but people of color are still being oppressed. And it makes me think about how even down to our skin color and the way we wear our hair. And a lot of people don't know, like very recently, there are American high schools that are really persecuting, especially American females for the way their hair looks and it's like oh well you're not allowed to have weed and you know there are checks where they line them up to make sure that their hair is natural and like things like that so um I don't know it's just opened my eyes on how like it doesn't matter how far we get we're always gonna have to fight to be free, truly free and, it, and it's okay because that's life it's a struggle and don't ever just think that you know don't ever be complacent, ever, you know? Right. As I think one of the things is this, the society that, that, that Europeans, Western Europeans created was a society that was off, built off the backs of other people, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's Native Americans and African people. And they've, they've created a very comfortable society for themselves, generally speaking. So meaning like you live in luxury, you live in nice houses, you get an air conditioning, you have fancy this, fancy that. But that's not the way the world has ever operated ever in the history of the world, mm -hmm. right? So naturally speaking, in our most rudimentary state, in our most, we, we'd all be struggling on a daily basis to live and survive. And I think that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't, don't take away or limit my freedom. That's when it becomes criminal. But it's okay. It's, I think it's okay to struggle. I think one of the things is, is we try to we we try to emulate uh, white people and being privileged. But I think I, I don't know how to say this, but I think being privileged is not so much a privilege if that makes any sense. <laughs> no, I think that makes sense. Yeah. You know, like without struggle, there's no progress. Yeah, you know, there's certain things that privileged people have or is there that I, I would never want. Like I would never want a certain mentality of, of a privileged person. That makes sense. I think I, I have a lot of um, non-Black friends that have told me, you know, they never realized how privileged they were until, you know, things like um, uh, what happened with uh, George Floyd or uh, what's the the other man's name, um, Ahmad Arbery. Am I saying that right? Yeah, yeah. They would, th and then you know, it's through all these, you know, little things or not little things, but all these things happening, and they happened like so quick 
yeah. the last year, they, you know, they would tell me, wow, you know, this is not something I worry about. Like, you know, I would tell them like how my mom, I have a, a younger brother. She worries about him going out every day. Yeah. She thinks, you know, what if he gets stopped? Something happens to him. Yeah. I mean, and so I definitely understand the idea that um, because I guess for uh, Caucasians, this is something that they just have. Yeah. They don't really see um, that they have it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. No, no, you're, no, you're absolutely right. It's like, uh, it's like the, and I'm not, I don't like, I don't like to say all, but like, sometimes it's like this fairy tale kind of, like attitude, the way they, just, the way they see the world, and it's like, almost nobody in the world, if you travel the world, sees the world in such a fairy tale kind of way, like everything is is perfect. But I think because we live so close to people that see the world that way, we wish we could see it like them. And I'm like, no one in the history of the world has ever seen the world to be so, so privileged and perfect, right? right? I think there's, I think there's a lot of like, there's a lot of good that comes out of living a life of, 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 of being alert and judicious and, 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 you know, conscious and struggle. Like, I'm not talking about like struggle, like, you, you know, someone will beat you up upside your head, but to work for something or to think about other people or to, you know, to have a double consciousness. There's, that's good. You know, the way I see it. I think we should embrace that. I, I definitely felt that way though. Like I wish I didn't live in the world where, you know, I have to constantly be aware that, I don't know, like having to fight, you know what I mean? Like I know growing up, my mom would always tell me, hey, you're gonna have to work so much harder than your counterpart because not only are you black, you're the daughter of immigrants and then you're a woman. And then it's like, okay, well, I understand that, but I'd like to, you know, I mean, get my dues as just a person. I don't want to be seen as just a woman who's black, who has a weird last name, you know what I mean? So, but um, I'm learning to, um, as you said, have the mindset that having to struggle is not necessarily a bad thing because it's just a part of life. Yeah, I mean, I struggle, there's no progress. That's what Frederick Douglass once said. I went to school with in Castleberry with a lot of uh, white boys who were my friends. And I think that the fact that I had to, I had to think about things in a different way than they did, it, it I think it allowed me to, to have the, some of the successes that I have that they don't have. Right. They lived a life with they didn't have to be conscious of anything. They were completely un, they completely unconscious all the way through school because they didn't have to double think about things like I did. And a lot and a lot of those kids I went to school with are now, you know, they're they didn't end up so well. The white boys. But, you know, me personally, I, I think I I internalized a lot of that stuff, like the teaching, man, that's kind of messed up. And so it made me want to fight harder against that kind of thing. It gave me a purpose, sense of purpose. When you're so privileged, you have no sense of purpose. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. I had one, but I forgot it, so. If anybody else wants to chime in, feel free. You know, I was just trying to find, I think it's sort of ironic. So last night I attend, I, I watched a um, uh, workshop that uh, if you're not familiar with his work, Richard Davidson, who's a neuroscientist who studies mindfulness so the workshop was a historian uh, on wisdom. The topic was about wisdom. Anyway, where I'm trying to go here is what you just said about you know having purpose. So when we look at well-being, 
right? You have to have a purpose. That's like the, you know, one of the four pillars of well being is to have meaning in life and purpose, right? And so, what I love right now is that within the mindfulness movement and contemplative work, whether it be in education or just, you know, well being work in health, you know, care, there's now a, a looking at, you know, we have to look at context and where people come from. So a lot of the teachings in mindfulness is to like have no sense of self because you know we're all one. But in certain communities, particularly the black community, that like goes against like you know internally how so many people feel like what are you talking about here? So there's a lot of work now being done to look at how we can you know speak to. Um, the experience of, you know, many people in the black community because mindfulness, right? Like right now, our world, we need it more than ever. Like look what's going on. Like if we don't start teaching accurate history, <laughs> you know, valuing wisdom, uh, trying to, you know, teach kids how to be aware of what's going on and reflect. And if we taught kids mindfulness, from early on and how to meditate, and this was part of our school, we would not see heat in like, it would take one generation. Like literally, like the science is showing what the Dalai Lama says can actually be, you know, we can see it come to fruition, but we need to be able to tap into where people are coming from to make it accessible to everyone. And I'm happy to see that this is, you know, this is, 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 is a scholarship that's, you know, being like, you know, really um, examined right now. So. Anyway, when you said purpose, it just made me think of that. We all need purpose. And that's the thing, you know, when we look at so many kids today who, you know, as a parent, we, you know, you, I, I can't say that I, I, I would say, well, I hope my kids struggle because that'll help them be resilient and that, right? No, <laughs> but yet at the same time. You don't want to give them too much though. Right, right. And that's so, the thing. And it's like, it's so, it's, it's so like a balance. Hard because, yeah, and it is. And it's, it's so hard because that's the thing. Resilience can be taught. It's not this innate, you have it or you don't. Yeah. But if you don't struggle in some way, right. Um, and anyway, I could go on that. Like kids struggle for, you know, you could social exclusion could be, you yeah. know, the, the, the tough struggle for, and it is the tough struggle for so many kids today. So I don't know, but purpose. Yep. We all need it. I have, I have some friends that will say things like, I want to give my kids everything that I didn't have growing up. And I think about it. I'm like, I'm like, but look how successful you are. Look how great you are. I was like, don't you want to try to give them the life close to what you did have so they can turn out like you? <laughs> and they're not realizing like they're kind of just flipping everything on its head because now you're going to do the exact opposite of what your parents did for you. And not realizing that that's what made you who you are. So, I don't know. I just like purpose. Like I, I can. I I have a garden in my backyard, and I like watching my food grow, planting seeds in the ground, and then eating it off the land. It gives that makes me feel like I have a sense of purpose. You know, like if I have to, if I go to the store and just buy my food I don't I feel some kind of way like <laughs> I mean it's it's one thing because I, I mean, I'm making the money from working and I'm get, I'm buying the food so I, I guess I feel like I'm doing something to get it but it's it's too easy you know but when you have this when you have to struggle I'll tell you a story I was I was lost in the woods once we were in Grenada and we went hiking in the mountains and we got lost out there and that was the first time I realized like, like what the importance of having a self, a, a sense of purpose was. Like we were lost and it was eight of us out there. And most of them were like little cousins of mine that weren't even teenagers. <laughs> and I was like the leader, me and my brother were like the leaders, but we're about the same age. And we had to lead the rest of the pack into safety. And we end up having to spend the night out in the woods overnight in the middle of the rainforest in Grenada. And, uh, but the fact that we had to like, just work as a team, figure it out. Like I had no thought of any vice in my head. Like, oh, I wonder what Netflix special is on. 
tonight or I, I'm gonna eat a donut like I wasn't thinking like that I just wanted to drink some water and get home I wanted the basic things of society I wanted the basic necessities and I remember when I finally we finally got out of the woods and we got back home because we we're hungry we we're, we're struggling out there when we finally got back home and everybody was all happy to have us back home they had a little party for us and they they, they my mom cooked so much food and everybody was watching TV and and I remember feeling depressed like what like what happened man and I kept telling them I want to go back out in those in those woods <laughs> there's something about being out there that gave me this natural adrenaline rush which is like why people people turn to drugs to get that same kind of rush it was why people turn to food why people turn to alcohol why people turn to cigarettes to get that rush that we naturally get from struggling. Maslow would say you had a peak experience <laughs> in, your, in your, the hierarchy of needs, right? You, you, it, it was like a self-actualizing moment, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, and not everybody is so fortunate. Yeah, man, I, was, I had that experience and it, it was like anticlimactic, like I just, when I came out of that, I, I, I really had to, I was, all, I was about to go back and that my family had to stop me. <laughs> How old are you? I was like, this was like six years ago. So I was, I was 30. Okay. okay. Hmm. A lot Thanks of my cousins that so were with much. me. Yeah. I'm sorry? No, I was just like, a lot of my cousins that were with me were like 16, 12, 10. <laughs> That's crazy. Thank y'all so, uh, so much for watching and, 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 and asking questions and stuff. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.